Praise be Jesus and Mary. Today's first reading comes from the Old Testament Book of Wisdom, where it's, which was believed to be written, written about 200 years before the coming of our Lord, and it was likely written in Egypt, in Alexandria, which at the time was a major center for what was called the Jewish Diaspora. Interestingly, the verses that we heard from Wisdom chapter 18 today in the first reading actually speak of the land of Egypt itself when it says in verses 14 through 16, it said, When peaceful stillness compassed everything in the night and its swift course was half spent, your all-powerful word from heaven's royal throne bounded a fierce warrior into the doomed land bearing the sharp sword of your inexorable decree, said the first reading today. Anyone who's familiar with the history of Israel knows that the author is referring to the last of the ten plagues which God sent upon Egypt, the plague of the death of the firstborn of man and beast alike. We read of that plague in the book of Exodus, chapter 12. In the stillness of the night, at midnight, it says, the Lord cut down all the firstborn in the land of Egypt. That's from Exodus 12, verses 29. And that's what induced Pharaoh at that time to finally let the Israelites go free so that they could worship their God in the desert. So the author of the Book of Wisdom is calling to mind that horrific yet glorious event that happened a thousand years before him, about 1200 or 1250 B.C., when God demonstrated his power over the false gods of Egypt and brought his people, Israel, out of slavery and bondage. So the fierce warrior that's referred to in those verses would be the angel of death, which was bearing the sharp sword of God's irrevocable decree against the Egyptians at that time. But there's something else that's very interesting about that verse in the Book of Wisdom. Uh, If any of you have ever heard the Christmas carol, the Christmas hymn, Lo, How a Rose Air Blooming, that verse actually comes up again. Uh, By the way, if you haven't heard that carol, it's actually very beautiful. You should listen to it. It's quite beautiful for this time of season. There's a refrain in that song, and the refrain is, when half spent was the night. And it's talking about the birth of Christ in Bethlehem. The the song goes, it came a flower bright amidst the cold of winter, when half spent was the night. And another verse says, To show God's love aright, she, meaning Mary, she bore to us a Savior when half spent was the night. So these same verses from the Book of Wisdom, which poetically retold that that tenth plague of Egypt, also have been interpreted as having foretold the birth of Jesus the Savior. And those verses again were, when peaceful stillness compassed everything in the night, In its swift course was half spent, this was the book of wisdom again, your all-powerful word from heaven's royal throne bounded a fierce warrior into the doomed land bearing the sharp sword of your inexorable decree, said the book of wisdom. The all-powerful word is then seen as the word incarnate as God himself in the flesh, as Jesus Christ. And he's presented as a fierce warrior sent into a doomed land. It reminds us of how St. Mark, excuse me, St. Matthew quotes the prophet Isaiah when he talks about Jesus' coming, when he says, St. Matthew says in Matthew 4, verse 16, the people who sat in darkness have seen a great light, and for those who sat in the region and shadow of death, light has dawned. Also, the fierce warrior, as that book of wisdom, that verse said, it says, is sent into the doomed land, quote, bearing the sharp sword of God's inexorable decree, said the Book of Wisdom. So did Jesus walk around carrying a sword? Well, doesn't Jesus himself say in Matthew 10, verse 34, do not think that I have come to bring peace on earth. I have not come to bring peace but a sword. Even Jesus talks about a sword. So we can see how those poetic words from the Book of Wisdom also apply to Jesus and his coming into this world and also his ministry. And that verse 16 from the Book of Wisdom, if you remember, it added this. It said, he, meaning the fierce warrior, still reached heaven while he stood upon earth. We know that Jesus, even when he was on earth in his divinity, was still with his Father in heaven. 
beside his father as well. So on the sixth day of the octave of Christmas, on December 30th, guess which scripture text the liturgy of the Mass uses as the entrance antiphon to the Mass. It's that text from the Book of Wisdom, Wisdom 8, verses 14 and 15. It's used to refer to Jesus' birth in the world. So this passage from the Book of Wisdom is a good example of the richness of sacred scripture and how there are different layers and there are different levels to the understanding even of just one simple text from the Bible. One other point that this reading brings to light, which we'll close with, is to mention the subject of evangelization and enculturation. Christianity, as we know, arose during, uh, under the Roman Empire, which in the first century AD encompassed all the lands surrounding the Mediterranean Sea. The culture of the Roman Empire was largely Hellenistic at the time, which means that it owed much of its culture to the Greeks, thanks to the conquests of Alexander the Great. For those of you who know history, Alexander the Great in the fourth century before Christ basically conquered all that land and that the culture became a Greek culture, a Hellenized culture. That's why, for example, the last book of the last books of the Old Testament we mentioned today, the Book of Wisdom, and also all the books of the New Testament, they were all actually written in Greek. Why? Because that was the universal language of the culture under the Roman Empire. So, if the New Testament were written today, it would probably be written in English because that's the, the, the dominant language. It's considered the modern-day universal language. Uh, in my opinion, it would be better for it to be written in American English rather than British English, but that's, that would just be a personal prejudice, I think. For the Hellenistic culture, truth and philosophy were actually very important. Uh, and truth was the main appeal of Christianity to the Hellenistic world. If you think of the first Christian apologists in the second century AD, like Saint Justin Martyr, you've got Tertullian, you've got Clement of Alexandria, you have St. Irenaeus, all of them focused on the truth of the gospel against the errors of the pagan religions and even against the errors of those who wanted to hold on to the Mosaic law and uh, the Jewish faith. St. Irenaeus, for example, emphasized that the truths of Christianity are accessible to everyone. And also he said that Christ is the true saving gnosis, which is Greek word for knowledge. Christ is the true saving knowledge. Clement of Alexandria stressed that Christianity was the true philosophy. Again, for the Hellenistic culture, philosophy was very important. So they said Christ, Christianity is the true philosophy, the true knowledge that leads to salvation. Tertullian, for his part, was so fanatical about the truth and so fanatical about combating error that he actually fell into error and he fell into heresy and finished outside the church because he forgot that truth has to be aligned with other virtues as well like charity like humility like obedience to the church but nonetheless you know truth was a huge appeal to the people at that time an appeal to the, the to bring the faith into the roman world and under the hellenistic culture and as we know from the Gospels, there's certainly a lot, <clears throat> a lot of foundation for that. For example, we know that Jesus himself said, what, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me, John 14, verse 6. We also know that he says in the same Gospel of St. John, if I say this a lot of time in the confessional, one of my favorite verses, he says, you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. So John 8, 32, so truth was big for the people in the first centuries and it attracted many truth seekers to the faith. What happened after that? Believe it or not, there was the fall of the Roman Empire. That happened in the fifth century and that's what, when uh, the Dark Ages actually began. The Dark Ages refers to the ages of the barbarian invasions into the West in the time where people were just struggling to survive and because they didn't have the stability and they didn't have the protection or the unifying force of the Roman Empire. So a lot of people were just struggling to survive under the invasions. The barbarians were barbaric in the sense that they didn't share, one, the cultural sensitivities of the Hellenistic culture, the, the cultural sensitivities that the, the Greeks and Romans embraced. The barbarians could care less about that. What did they love? They loved fighting, they loved conquering, they loved war. Uh, the word barbarian was actually coined by the Greeks. It was basically an insult to the, the conquering peoples. They said that, the Greeks said that, well, they, 
speak unintelligent gibberish, basically bar, bar, that was a way of insulting their way uh, of speaking, and the fact that they were also uncivilized, the Greeks criticized them for that, uncivilized meaning they lived outside of the city, so they weren't from within the city, they actually came from without, so they were uncivilized, hence they were crude and backward, and the Greeks complained about them for that, and to a certain extent they were correct, but one thing's also certain, the barbarians knew how to fight, and they knew how to conquer, so be careful when you start insulting certain people, uh, especially if they're barbarians. The church, in her wisdom, made an effort to adapt, adapt its evangelization to the barbarian tribes. The barbarian tribes included the Visigoths, those who sacked Rome in 410. They included the Vandals and the Huns. You've heard of probably Attila the Hun, a very famous uh, barbarian leader of the, the Huns. There's, there were the Ostrogoths. There were the Angles and the Saxons. There were was a German tribe known as the Franks who conquered Gaul. That's where we get the word France from. France is a modern day France, comes from those who conquered it, the Franks. There was also the Lombards, the Lombards, which the name means long beards. When I thought of that, I actually thought there was an actress in the, in the 1940s named Carol Lombard. I don't know if you, any of you know of her. She actually died in a plane crash very tragically in the 40s. So if you want to say a prayer for her, that would be good. Uh, I think her last movie was To Be or Not To Be with Jack Benny. Actually, it's a very good movie. I really enjoyed it. It was about Nazi occupation. I don't think she had a long beard, but uh, her name reminded me. Carol Lombard. Where does she get that name from? It was actually the name of one of the, one of the barbaric tribes back in the Dark Ages. Anyway, the barbarians, again, they weren't interested in Greek culture. They weren't so much interested in the truth, but they were interested in power and in a warrior spirit. They were looking for a supernatural power or a strength that demonstrated that the Christian God was actually greater than all the other gods. And uh, we know that the church actually had to bring the gospel to them as well, not just to the Greeks or to the Romans, because Jesus said, go and make disciples of all nations. He said, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. He said in Matthew 28, verses 19 through 20. So the church knew that she had to bring salvation to these people. So what did she do? Well, the missionaries actually presented to the barbarians the image of Christ as a warrior, as a fierce warrior, as a model for warriors, because he endured pain without flinching, and he overcame all of his enemies. He conquered sin. He conquered death. He conquered Satan. Uh, and the martyrs were presented to the barbarians as brave men and women slain in battle. The martyrs were presented that way. And they were also presented as manifesting a courage that was even greater than the courage of a warrior. There's even an old English poem called The Dream of Rude, which was written in the 6th, 7th century AD. It was written perhaps by Cademan, an English poet. He portrays Christ in that poem as a great chief who triumphed over Satan. He presents the apostles. How does he present them? As his faithful warriors, as the faithful warriors of Christ. He presents heaven. How does he present heaven? As the victorious banquet hall where you go and celebrate after all your victories have been won. Uh, so at the time of the barbarian invasions, a Catholic could read that verse that we heard today in the Book of Wisdom, where it says, Your all-powerful word from heaven's royal throne bounded a fierce warrior into the doomed land, bearing the sharp sword of your inexorable decree. You know, someone could read that and explain to the barbarians, See, Christ is also a fierce warrior, just like you. He brandishes the sword of victory, just like you as well. It was a new approach to evangelization, but believe it or not, for the most part, it actually worked, since all the, the barbarian tribes sooner or later embraced the faith. Uh, I think some of them fell away, but for the most part, and by and large, all of them were converted to the gospel. That's a lot to say. What's the conclusion we want to draw from all this? Well, two conclusions. One is that scripture has a, death, a depth and a richness, which I don't think most of us will ever fully understand in this life. I don't think we could probably understand or appreciate it so much in this life. Two, also we want to know that Jesus allows the church to adapt the gospel in ways that become more comprehensible and more acceptable to different peoples at different times and in different cultures. Now adapting the gospel doesn't mean changing or distorting it. 
but it does mean highlighting certain truths of the faith which speak more to a certain people and to certain mentalities, to certain sensibilities. It takes a lot of wisdom to know how to do that. But more importantly, it takes trust in God and it also takes the guidance of the Holy Spirit. For example, it seems like the church nowadays does focus a lot on the mercy of God and because of the sinfulness of many people, uh, many who have abandoned the faith on the one hand, and also because many people struggle with finding hope or seeing hope in their lives. And since our culture is very materialistic and hedonistic and self-centered, and if you put those three things together, materialism, hedonism, self-centered living, you put those together, what does that end up leading to? It leads to despair at the end of our life. So the church focuses a lot on the mercy of God, on divine mercy. And it's something which recent popes have put a lot of focus on, thanks especially, I think, to the revelations of, of St. Faustina. But at the same time, we know that in order to receive God's mercy, we have to be repentant. There has to be repentance. Uh, there has to be a turning away from sin. There has to be a turning back toward God. Where there's no repentance, there's no mercy. Uh, so that also has to be preached as well, the need for repentance in this, the hour of God's mercy. So let's just today pray that Our Lady will send to earth more figures like St. Gertrude the Great, like St. John the Baptist, like St. Francis of Assisi, like Mother Teresa of Calcutta, men and women who truly recall us back to our need for God and the need and the importance of truth and the, the importance of the reality of eternity as well. Where Christ in eternity, the fierce warrior of God, still reigns supreme over every real, visible and invisible reality. And as far as mercy goes, let's ask Our Lady to learn to have hearts of mercy towards others because that converts more than the sword converts. Praise be Jesus and Mary.